If you have your Bible, turn with me to John chapter 18, and today we're going to wrap up a sermon series. We've been walking through the I Am statements of, of Jesus, and uh, you know you can see through, uh, through what we've preached through the last couple of weeks, uh, Jesus is the bread of life, He is the light of the world, He is the gate, He is the good shepherd, He is the resurrection and the life, He is the way, the truth, and the life, He is the true vine. And, and all those things are, are wonderful, they are great, they are absolutely true, but the question that you and I face then is, well, will he follow through? Will he follow through? I mean, just take one of these. Is he the bread of life? As we navigate our life, as we go from, you know, Sunday to Monday to Tuesday, as we go through the week, is he there and able to sustain us through things? Like, is he really what we're looking for? And, and I think they kind of culminate um, kind of in this moment where we recognize that Jesus is all-powerful. And, and just to kind of give you a background of the situation, what's happening is that they are celebrating the Passover. The Passover was a meal that celebrates uh, when Egypt was brought out of slavery. Remember, God parted the Red Sea and they were coming into the Promised Land. It was, it was that meal that celebrated that the freedom that the Israelites would experience. They were no longer slaves. They would be God's people. They would, they would be his. And so they're celebrating that. And so you had crowds. You had thousands of people flocking to Jerusalem. And there was a huge crowd. In fact, this is um, you know, Palm Sunday. And they, would, they shouted. So we see this picture of Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people crowding around him. Thousands of people shouting out to him, Hosanna in the highest. God save us. Like that was kind of their thing. And, and the difficulty with this is that while they were God's people, while they were, you know, the, the chosen nation that God was going to bring forth the Messiah, they were also under Roman occupation. So every time they went to the temple to worship the God that brought them out of slavery, there was the Roman soldier with the sword. Every time they went past, they went over a road, there was the Roman tax collector collecting a fee. So they, were, they stood in this unique posture of being free in God as that they were the chosen nation to bring forth the Messiah. But they were thoroughly <laughs> under control of Rome. And so during these times of feast, during the Passover, people were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for a revolution. They were looking to be freed from Roman occupation. And so as Jesus comes in riding on the donkey, the masses of people who were there to celebrate their nationality were saying, this is the guy that we want. This is the guy that's actually going to bring us freedom and to kick, the, kick Caesar out. This is the guy that's going to... Bring us forward. But, but here's the problem is that they were not looking for the kingdom that Jesus was ushering in. They were looking for a political solution to an earthly problem. They were looking for a political solution to an earthly problem. So there was just kind of this overtone of chaos. And we all know that chaos is chaotic. Right? It's kind of obvious. But some of you are feeling that. The, the other thing that was happening is Rome was Rome. And so as the Roman Empire continued to expand, what would they have to do to maintain peace? The Pax Romana, this fake peace that, that they promised everybody, is that they would have to keep conquering. So they couldn't just stop where they were. They just had to keep conquering. So what do you do with the nations that you've conquered? Well, you impose taxes on them. You have soldiers come in, you have this occupation, but then you also have this idea of worshiping Caesar, worshiping the emperor. And, and that's kind of what Rome did. And the problem is then, it, well, what they would do then is they would put in governors and their whole job of a, a governor was to maintain the peace. So if there was any upheaval, if there was any kind of sniff, whiff of revolt, the governor then would go and put his foot down on the throat of that revolution. And so you had this tension of thousands of people coming to Jerusalem for the Passover. And you had the Roman army kind of sitting there. And you had Pontius Pilate who was like, I don't want to die. 
what am I going to do with this revolution? And so you kind of had these kind of things working. And then at the same time, you had the people crying out to say, yes, this is our Messiah. You had the chief priests, the Sanhedrin, all those people who were religious leaders kind of like, you know what? We're a little jealous of Jesus. We, we don't want that kind of kingdom. We want a kingdom that kind of gets rid of Rome. And so you see this tension, this, this chaos, if you will, and it was chaotic. And I think that in this situation, it kind of sets us up for similar in our life. Is it's like it's not just this one thing that's going on in our life. It's this tension of maybe it's your marriage and your job. Maybe it's your beliefs and your kids. Maybe it's just all of it together and it's like your health is going haywire. Or it's like, I don't know if I'm going to have enough to, to retire. Or I don't know. And it's just this, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And you look at these words and you say that Jesus is the bread of life. And you say, yes, Jesus, you are the bread of life. But can you follow through with your, with your promise? In other words, Jesus, I know that you're the good shepherd. But are you powerful enough to follow through with those words, with those promises in my life? And so that's what we're going to look at today. So here's what happened. They finished the Passover meal. They, they finished the high priestly prayer. So Jesus, right before he goes to the cross, and I love this, and, and it doesn't really have anything to do with the sermon, but I put it in there because I love this passage so much. And he prays for you and me. He prays for those that will believe. How cool is that? That before Jesus goes to the cross, he has you on his heart, on his mind. Now, ultimately, it's obedience, right, to the cross, like our Gethsemane. But, but right before then, as he's like walking out of the upper room with the disciples, he has the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17. And I would encourage you to go and read that this week. But he prays this prayer. And then after they're kind of digesting all these things, he gives them this promise to the disciples. Because he knows what's going to happen to the disciples. But here's what he says. Look at what he says here in John 16, 33. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have what? Tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. And I love that. We hold on to the promises of God for salvation, but do we hold on to the promises that say that we will have tribulation when we face this world? Or do we just kind of gloss over that so that we can hold on to these other things? You see, in this moment, he was preparing his disciples of the persecution that they were going to face. He was preparing his disciples for the tribulations and the troubles and, and the, the, the sleepless nights and the lack of food. And, the, and he was preparing him for all those things of the, those moments in our lives where we go, God, I don't know if I can handle just one more thing. That's what he was speaking into their lives. He says, hey, you will face persecution. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have come. I have overcome the world. And that's when he prays for us. So they finish that and then they go, they cross over the Kidron, the, the brook Kidron. Here's what it says, John chapter 18, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. This was a ravine east of the city of Jerusalem, separating the Temple Mount from the, temple, from the Mount of Olives. The Kidron Valley was um, kind of this place in Jewish history where King David crossed over when he was rejected by the nation. Huh, wonder what's going to happen there if Jesus is the fulfillment of King David and the promise that Jesus is the better king. David was rejected in this moment. Jesus was crossing this brook. I think that the author was trying to make a parallel when he was rejected by the nation and betrayed by his son Absalom. So they enter into the olive grove, the garden of Gethsemane. And here's the moment. John 18, 2 through 3, it says this. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, see those two groups? Why are they both there? The cohort of the Roman soldiers and the chief priests, this wasn't some bureaucrat sitting across the desk. This was a security detail for the Sanhedrin. It was the police of the Sanhedrin. So those two groups, having procured, procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. A cohort would have probably have been 600 soldiers. That's a lot of soldiers for one guy. But again, this was a place of, this was a time where they were celebrating the Passover. Honestly, I don't know that they knew what they were going to get. Multiple times in Jesus' ministry, the, the crowds grabbed him, tried to force him to become king. He said, I, That's not how I'm going to become king. I'm not going to become king because I win some political battle. I'm going to become king because I am king. And and I'm not gonna, you're not gonna usher me into this moment like this. I have to go through the cross. And so Jesus backs up. So we don't know. Like Judas could have been like, you know what? I think tonight's the night. I think tonight's the night where where there's gonna be thousands of people there. What do we do? Pilate says, you know what? I can't have a revolt because if that starts revolting, Caesar looks down, he sees the chaos that's happening in Judea. I'm dead. I don't want to be dead. Let's just take, let's just show an over, let's just show force. Send a whole cohort, 600 soldiers, let's send them, let's get them there. And they show up with lanterns and torches and weapons. The crowd was ripe for revolution. Pilate and the chief priests would be pleased. Uh, The soldiers from both the Sanhedrin worked through the night illegally. This is it. We're going to do it. Get all our ducks in a row. We're going to arrest him. The Sanhedrin's going to go meet through the night with Jesus. And they're going to pass him over to Rome. We're going to crucify him uh, later. That was the plan. Then Jesus, he sees this. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward to them. Who do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. It's another I am statement. It's like what Matt talked about as we were worshiping this I am statement. It's like what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. This I am statement, it recalls the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. It's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Of Exodus 3, 6, and 14, where it says, in, in which God unveiled his identity to Moses as the I am who I am. Thus, when every time Jesus says, I am, he is claiming to be the ever existing, self existent God. That was his claim. So the soldiers come up, they're standing all there. Jesus steps out. Hey, who are you looking for? One of them says, Jesus of Nazareth. He gets up. He says, I am. I'm God. All the power. All the authority. All of that wrapped up into me. That's who I am. And look at what happens. I love this little commentary. 18.6, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and they fell to the ground. You got 600 soldiers in the security detail from the Sanhedrin, fantastic. We got Jesus. All of that power, impressive as this band was, a little arithmetic applied to Matthew 26, 53, where the parallel passage, Matthew tells us that in that moment, Jesus says, I can bring 12 legions of angels. It provides an astonishing insight into the power available to Jesus. A legion consists of 6,000 men. So 12 legions of angels equals 72,000 angels. 
Now, one angel can easily annihilate 185,000 trained soldiers. Second Kings 19.35 tells us that. So an army of 72,000 angels can easily cope with 13 billion men. More than twice the world's present population. And the figure scientists suggest represents this globe's absolute capacity to support. The population in Jesus' day has been estimated to be 200 million. All the authority, the authority in this moment is not in the number of troops, but in the powerful presence of Jesus. Make no mistake about this. No one took Jesus' life. He laid it down. So the soldiers get up. Can you, can you imagine that conversation just for a moment? As they fall down in his presence and they're going like, are we still going through with this? This is what we want to do? So Jesus starts the conversation then. So he asks them again, who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And this was to fulfill the word that had been spoken to them. Uh, of these whom you gave me, I have not lost one. It is truly amazing that at this moment, Jesus is caring for the eleven. Chad Bird, he says this, if there is one truth we know about Christ beyond any doubt... It's that hell and all its demons cannot make him budge one inch from those whom he calls his friends. I feel like I've got some good stuff in the rest of the sermon. I feel that way because I wrote it. But there are probably some of you here right now that are just going through some sort of tribulation, some sort of trial that you're facing, and you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Heck, you don't even know what this afternoon is going to bring. And I just want to remind you that Jesus has not abandoned you. That he will never forsake you. And that's all you need to remember this week. But for the rest of us, let's keep moving. Then Simon Peter, having a sword. <laughs> I love his passion. 600 soldiers, they all fall down. They start getting up. He pulls out the sword that they were probably <laughs> killing the, the meal with the, earlier that night. He drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. Interesting tidbit, that servant's name was Malchus. Great name. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? From the parallel passages in the other Gospels, we know that Jesus then healed Malchus's ear. Look at this though. Look at the contrast. Look at, look at where people think their power comes from. Look at where, where the this Roman soldiers thought that the power would come from. Look at where Pilate says, Pilate's like, hey, you know what? I don't want to, I don't want another revolt. I better squash this. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna send six, I'm gonna send a cohort, I'm gonna send a band of soldiers. Look at the chief priests. Look at what they're saying. They're saying, you know what? I, we don't like this Jesus. He's causing a lot of problems with us. You know what? I know we don't agree with Rome. I know we want them out of Rome. But if Jesus comes to authority, we're going to lose our positions. There was a jealousy there. And so what did they do? You know what? Rome's got a big army. Let's go ahead and put Rome forward. Look at Peter. Look at what Peter did. You know what? Here we go. Let's pull out the sword. 
Let's fight our way through, Jesus. This is the moment. This is the time. Let's just, let's just keep fighting. All kingdoms and individuals who stake their claim with violence will eventually be destroyed by similar physical force. And what's amazing, what, what's amazing in here, I mean, Jesus' clarity about all this. Think about it. This was the tw- you know, these were the 11 disciples that he had spent his entire ministry with. These were the people that he was commissioning to go out and be witnesses to the world. Had they started fighting, they would have all been dead. And so Jesus settles them down. And he gives this incredible... Powerful truth. Jesus' mission. Christianity. Will never advance. Or be hindered by a sword. Christianity will never advance. Or be hindered by a sword. And he looks at Peter and says. I need to take the cup. I need to come and do what I was. What I'm supposed to do. All of the Old Testament prophecies about the prophet and the priest and the king being fulfilled in the Christ and the Messiah. The Christ, the Messiah has a specific task that he has to accomplish. I, I love it when Jesus casts demons out of people. It demonstrates his authority over the demonic, over the spiritual world. This last week I had several conversations of that moment where, where Jesus was crossing the storm of Galilee and he was tired and so he took a nap. So he gets in, so he's in, this, he's in the boat in the Sea of Galilee and the disciples are there and they're fishermen. So they've been on this boat, this whole, you know, they've been in, on this lake their entire lives. And all of a sudden this storm comes up on them and it's going this way and that way and the people that are used to this are like, they start freaking out. And, and Jesus, they wake Jesus up and they say this big question that we all ask sometimes. Don't you care about us? And Jesus gets up and you know what he does? He just calms the storm. And the rough waters become like glass. And, and what I love about this moment is that there are times where, you know, we see Jesus teaching about, you know, we see teach, Jesus teaching with authority. We see him casting out demons. We, he, we see him healing the sick. But in this moment, the disciples look at him and go, they back up. And it says that they were, they marveled and they were afraid because this person, this God can change nature. <laughs> All of that, all of that is important. But all of that was simply to point to Jesus' purpose as the Christ, as the Messiah. Look at what it says in Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why he came. Because I'm a sinner. Because I've known what the things I shouldn't do and I do those things anyway. And I know what I should do and I don't do those things. And that sin, that iniquity, that that creates a chasm between me and God. And it's a problem that I cannot fix on my own. It's a problem that only God can fix. And that's why he came and he, he took our grief. 
He took our sin. And so as Peter is looking at this and he's saying, as he pulls out his sword and says, let's go, Jesus. Jesus says, that's not how my kingdom works. He says, I have to take up the cup. I have to lay down my life. Jesus, in this, in this moment, though, here's what we see. Here's the bottom line for today. Jesus is all powerful and he leads his people to victory. Jesus is all powerful and he leads his people to victory. Think about it, both of those ways, whether through military might or, you know, as, as Peter is going to, it's, it's this idea that it's not our ways that how God leads us. He leads us in his way and his is the way of the cross. And that is what gives us victory. Jesus has all the power and he leads his people in victory. So I have a couple questions then for us to wrestle with as we're looking at this and we're seeing the power that Jesus has as he's being arrested and he restrains that power so that he can drink the cup that he was given. Here's the question that you and I have to wrestle with then. Why don't we experience the power of Jesus in our life? I mean, if Jesus is all powerful, if he has all the angels at his disposal, if he, you know, even more than that, if he is the agent of creation where God speaks and things come into existence, why is it that we don't experience the power of Christ? Why is it that we experience the exact opposite power? That we are wavering, that we are unsure, that we are unstable, that we are fickle and we are indecisive. I think there's two that strike at the heart of this. I think the first one is this, is that we are looking for earthly solutions for spiritual problems. Just like the military cohort, we are trying to find earthly solutions to our situations. And usually it has to deal with changing our circumstances. And I'm not saying that God doesn't change our circumstances, but here's what I know, is that if we're not wrestling with something, if we don't figure something out, if we move, if we switch jobs, if we go get a new family, if we go get a new career, if we haven't dealt with that stuff in our previous life, you know what happens? It shows itself in our other life. Because the problem is not in my circumstances. The problem is in my heart. The, the problem is, is I have not surrendered to that authority. So that's the first one. Is that we are looking for earthly solutions for spiritual problems. Just like they were looking at the military co cohort. But second thing. And I think this one probably hits a little bit closer to home for most of us. Is something that we would never say out loud to anybody. But if we were honest with ourselves in that moment that we're looking in the mirror with ourselves, that we're forced to face our reality is this. We don't really want what he offers. We don't really want what he offers. I don't want to forgive that person. I don't want a life of insignificance. I want to be better and faster and stronger. I don't want a I don't want what he offers. And Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 8, 6 and 8, he says this. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind of the, on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. And it does not submit to God's law. It did not. It... Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You see, here's what happens. When, when you and I surrender our life to Christ, He seals us with His Spirit. 
He marks us as his own. He gives us this incredible gift, the, the indwelling of the Spirit, where it's just, that's what you have. That's who you are. It says that you are hidden with Christ. And, and what happens then is that we still wrestle with our flesh. We were, I liken it like this. We were on a mission trip a, a long time ago. And um, just the culture, when you go to a mission trip, you kind of have to fall in with the culture. Because you don't want to be a burden and all that stuff. And so it's important that you do that. Well, on this particular mission trip, um, all the guys were allowed to go to the work site. We were building a school. And the girls had to stay at home and cook, you know. You could not go to the grocery store. And so we were going to have chicken that night. (laughs) So I show up. All the guys come back home from the work site. And all the girls were freaking out because if you, don't get the, if you don't get chicken from the grocery store, where do you get it from? Your backyard. <laughs> and they explained to us how when they cut off the chicken's heads, you know what the rest of the chicken does? It continues to flap around. And so they're explaining this, and, and that's the description of sin, is that when you surrender your life to Christ, You are a new creation in Him. Your spirit has been renewed, but you and I still wrestle with our flesh. And just like the dead chicken, sometimes it pops its head up. Or not its head, it pops its wing up. (laughs) That's what happens. And so Paul says, here's what happens then when you focus on the things of the flesh, when you think, if you're trying to satisfy your flesh, you cannot please God in that. Instead, it's that we focus on the spirit. And he said, here's the problem is that most of us, we relish in our flesh. Why do we not experience the power of God? Because our set, we set our minds on the flesh. So then how do we receive God's power? Well, he goes on in verse 11. He says, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's focusing on the spirit. That's how we receive the power of God is through his spirit. Uh, That's why Jesus ascended, right? Like he was crucified, he was buried, he rose again on the third day. He witnessed to other, you know, he showed himself to people. And then what? He ascended into heaven. He took his throne in heaven. And when he was in heaven, he poured out his spirit onto his people. You and I, we receive that spirit. When we surrender our lives to Christ, we receive that spirit. We receive that power. So what is the victory then? If we get that power, we focus on the Spirit. What is the victory that Jesus leads us in? Where is He leading us? And there's so many things. Just think about this. He he leads us in creation. Jesus was the agent of creation. God spoke and things came into existence. The Word of God. Jesus. When you have a creative moment in your life, That's the Spirit working in you and through you. Did you know that when in the Old Testament, when you look at the Spirit coming on people, the first time that is mentioned is when they were building when they were building the tabernacle. You and I, we worship a creative God, and He uses His Spirit to empower His His people for creativity. There's so many things like that. But how about this? How about some other things? How about just to obey? He gives us victory to obey. He gives us victory to overcome sin and temptation. He gives us victory to to have authority over darkness. He gives us victory as the healer of broken hearts. Hope in despair. Strength in weakness. But ultimately, ultimately, we land on this. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We know that whatever situation you're going through, 
whatever trial and tribulation that you're going through, God's power will work in the life of the believer and it will come out for good. It might not come out for good the way that the world looks at good, but through the lens of heaven, he says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. And what that's speaking of is that when you and I surrender our life to Christ, again, we wrestle with the flesh. But there will be a point where you will never wrestle with the flesh again. Because as just as Jesus resurrected from the grave and has a glorified body, you too, you and me, who those of us that have put our faith in Christ, we will rise again. And our bodies too will be glorified. And we will never wrestle with the flesh ever again. Man, I can't wait for that day. Man, I cannot wait for that day. So it's this glorification and ultimately then defeating sin and death. So here's a, one more question to give you. In your current situation, what would it look like for you to rely on Jesus' power? In your current situation, what would it look like for you to rely on Jesus' power? For some of you, you've never surrendered your life to Christ. You've continued, to try, you've continued to try to build your own kingdom, your own kingdom, your own kingdom, and you've hit a dead end, and you said, you know what? I just can't do it anymore. I've tried religion, I've tried irreligion, and I'm just kind of stuck here. And so you thought, you know what? I'm going to give Christianity a try. I'm going to, I drive past that church. I'm going to walk in that church. Or I'm flipping through, you know, I'm scrolling through the internet thing, and I saw that good-looking pastor. I'm going to go to that church. <laughs> You know, that, that's, and, and it's like, you're curious now, and I would just encourage you to keep, but how long are you going to keep waiting? How long are you going to keep pushing it off? Because pushing it off is a decision. Because pushing it off is a decision. So what would it look like in your life to, to surrender, to, 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 surrender to, re, to actually rely on Jesus' power and say, you know what, it's not my life anymore, God, it's your life. But for the life of the believer, this is one of those things where this is not a one-time decision and then you're done with it. This is a decision that you make continually over and over and over again in your life. Where you say, okay, not my will, God, your will. Not my will, God, your will. Uh, not, not my way, not through my means, not through my cleverness, not through my you know, personality, not through my whatever it is. And it's, it's continuing to surrender to him over and over and over again. It's taking up your cross daily and following him and walking in the path of obedience. The life of the believer. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Because there's one more situation. And while they're coming up, I just want to talk about one more situation. That we, we receive his power. And you can do a study on this. I would encourage you to do that. How, when believers see... When the believers experience the power of God in their lives in the New Testament. And there's a few moments where it's very clear that they, see, they receive God's power. So a lot of you are like, well, I wonder why we, I don't experience God's power. And it's because you're lining up with, one, the flesh, but it's two, something else. But, but here's, here's the question that just drives me. Uh, M.S. Mills says this. And it's been kind of echoing with me um, as I've been studying this. I wonder whether Malchus, remember Malchus, the, the, the servant of the high priest, he got his ear cut off. Here's what he says. I wonder whether Malchus became a believer. He certainly had grounds for conviction every time he, his ear itched. The fact that his name was given six decades after the event suggests that he was well known to the initial readers of John. His name does not appear again in the New Testament. So Mill's conclusion is this. So this may indicate that, indeed, that he did indeed place his faith in Jesus as the Messiah. I don't know. I, I hope so. That would be amazing. Like you get up there and Malchus is there. And 
But here's one of the places that you and I know that we receive power. You see, before Jesus ascended into heaven, he commissioned his church. Look at what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Yeah, amen. I love that, right? When the Holy Spirit comes, we will receive power. But then look at what he says that power is meant to do. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You see, so oftentimes we we want to receive power. We want want to do the miracles, right? Like we want to we want to see, you know, whatever it is, get lightning bolts from the sky. But this says that we will receive power when we share. When we witness, when we point people to Jesus, that's when you and I receive the power of the Holy Spirit.